Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Note to File podcast, a collection of interviews, best practices, and candid commentary for clinical research sites. Our guest today is Jeffrey Smythe. He's the VP and COO for More Clinical Research, uh, located in Tampa, Florida. Uh, He's been there since 2011. He also holds a master's degree in healthcare administration. In this episode, we discuss e-source, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. Enjoy. All right, Jeff, thanks so much for coming on today. I know we've gone uh, back and forth on scheduling a little bit, so I I do apologize, but welcome and thank you for coming on. Thank you, Brad. Nice to uh, be here with you talking and would love to share uh, all the information that I have. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I know that uh, you want to talk and we're sort of scheduled to talk here a little about e-source, e-reg, and sort of uh, what that brings to the table for for sites. And uh, But I kind of want to start, uh, tell me a little bit about what you're doing right now and maybe even go all the way back to where you started. I like to kind of hear people's origin stories about clinical research. So if you wouldn't mind uh, telling us a little bit about your background and kind of where you're at now. Okay, like, you know, many other people, have said I didn't start in research. I just landed in research about nine years ago. I started um, in healthcare about 30 years ago, working in a hospital. I worked in two hospitals in my career in radiology, and I was a radiology director. Up until 2011, I moved to Tampa, Florida, and I started working in research at more clinical research. I started as uh, the director of operations and then was promoted to the VP, chief operating officer, and have been working in research for the past nine years. Um, So it's uh, been a very interesting journey for me. And um, I, what I like about it is I bring all of the operational ideas and initiatives that we had in the hospital environment, and I try and apply them to the research environment. And a lot of them can be uh, very easily. So in keeping with, you know, the electronic initiatives that are out there in the industry now, especially, you know, everybody pays attention to it once a pandemic hits. But we were actually looking at many of these before COVID-19. So, um, and actually to rewind 10 years ago, before I left um, the hospital I was working at, we had a lot of electronic paperless initiatives in progress, uh, electronic medical record system and all the other things that go along with that in the hospital environment. So, and I know I've mentioned this to you before, once I started in working in research, it was like going back in time and really not using much uh, software or electronic devices or anything because everything was on paper. And it was was a little disappointing, but I got used to it. And um, what I really have not liked about paper for so long is it costs money. It costs sites extra money to use paper. That's, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about the last nine years. And luckily, um, I would say about seven years ago, we um, looked into uh, using a CTMS. Sure. And I really pushed our site in that direction. We were at that time only using software to book appointments. Everything else was on paper. And uh, I wanted us to be able to use the subject's information. I had been reading about databases and how important they were in clinical research And we had information in a software system for appointments, and I wanted to put that into a larger scale platform so that as we were getting busier and busier with trials, that we were going to build this database that was going to help us recruit patients in the future. So that's where all of this really started. And uh, so we landed with real-time CTMS and way back, and we've been with them since, and we've you know, we are very happy customers of theirs. And now we're using all of their platforms, everything that they offer, we are using them. And uh, we are trying to gain efficiencies with everything that these software items can provide to a site. So I'm a big proponent of all of this stuff. And, you know, what's funny is along the way, along your journey, There are so many people in research and, you know, sponsors, CROs, monitors that are so hesitant to get away from paper and so hesitant for things to be, you know, stored in a system and maintained electronically. We've had to overcome a lot of that fear 
and uh, talk through uh, these things and show people how these things can work and how we meet the regulation and how they're HIPAA compliant and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's truly been a journey, but uh, we are very happy with where we are now. Sure. And that's something I, I'm particularly interested in hearing about. So, you know, we used real time at our organization previously. We we switched over to using Creo, which I, I really like and I like the e-source system. And I, I always consider myself, you know, I want to be ahead and be doing the next thing, which is I think everyone using e-source and whatnot. And mm -hmm. I've been hesitant just because of my fear of slow adoption from the sponsor. Uh, not to, not to mention, you I mean, having to train some of my investigators is, you know, presents its own issues at times as well. Um, so I'm, I'm real curious to hear a little bit about how well it's being adopted by the sponsors that you're dealing with. And then, you know, if, does it require a, you know, convincing or are most of them pretty like, okay, this is good. We're, we're starting to see this now. We're, we're good to go. What, what's your experience been like thus far? Um, well, if I may, let's back up about a year and a half. We started using Realtime's e-regulatory system um, about a year and a half ago because we saw the potential for efficiencies with how these regulatory documents are signed and transferred and stored and shared. And it just made total sense to get away from a paper binder that had a lot of redundant information in it and to be able to store all of that electronically because, you know, you there's so many head-scratching moments for a site because a lot of these documents are being emailed to the site, but yet we were printing them and putting them in a paper binder. So it made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> so. Right. Just adding another step to the process for, for no good reason. Absolutely. Adding another step. Another side note, we have always had a closed shared network at our company. And we have an IT service. They created a shared network. And we were storing a lot of documents on our closed network. And it's now become our redundancy because we don't put anything directly into the CTMS. We upload it to our shared network and then we put it into the CTMS and uh, it's secure. And we view that as our redundant system for the CTMS. That's just what's worked best for us. So is that a, uh, is that a dedicated position or, or is that just done by the same coordinator who, who uploads it just for my own <laughs> interest is how do you structure that? It's really, it depends on what the documents are and who really is the owner of that document. It could be the director, it could be the coordinator. It really depends on their job function. But everybody essentially who is on the study, they have access to that. And they, you know, if they receive the document, they can save it and then upload it. So gotcha. I think it, that depends on your organization and what, and what works best for you. Sure, sure. So, yeah, um, using EREG was the first step. And, you know, there were conversations about that. You know, obviously, the first thing is you have to show them, you know, your, your records and your SOPs for using it. The, you know, the statements that, you know, it's 21 CFR Part 11 compliant, it's HIPAA compliant. It's all of these things so that they feel comfortable about it. You, what I love about real time is it is so intuitive. It is so easy for a monitor, or an inspector, or anybody to log in and to review the information. It's very intuitive, step by step kind of process to where it doesn't take a lot of training you know, in order to use the system. It's it's not very difficult at all. That's what we like. Sure. But yeah, we had to have some robust communication with some uh, partners, and but we didn't have anybody really push back on us. And I think EREG was, you know, we were joining in EREG at a time when a, a lot of other sites were doing that as well. And so we were kind of doing it at the right time. So we've been really successful with that. This year, uh, Real Time um, released their eSource platform. We were we've been thinking about it, looking into it, and then really what promoted that was COVID nineteen and the idea that you know monitors needed remote monitoring and we needed a secure way of doing that instead of just emailing documents back and forth. So we started using that, and uh, it has been 
we, we believe we have been very successful with that so far. Now we're only in our second month of using the system, but um, the investigators like it. We have iPads and some of them like to use an iPad for data entry. Some of them would rather have a laptop and use it. Uh, what we like about it so far is we can see where it's going to reduce a lot of queries. Sure. It's going to reduce a lot of minor protocol deviations uh, because of, um, you know, writing or whatever was written on the paper was written incorrectly or, you know, human error, some sort of misspelling of a word or somebody signs in the wrong place or, you know, anything that can happen in source documents. And we can see where it brings a lot of integrity to the data because the data is so much cleaner. And the way that you build the source, it becomes very intuitive for the person who is capturing the source to enter those data points correctly. At the time that the patient is there contemporaneously, it's, it really, I think, drives value in the data that we're providing to the sponsor. Sure. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Do you have uh, somebody on your team? team or on your staff that builds the source into real time or is that a service that they offer as a CTMS they pro- they provide that service and they'll do that to you know for you i believe with new customers they will you know do a build or two for you and uh, until you're comfortable doing that sure. um our, we have a site manager who really is our lead coordinator who is also, you know, our compliance person who is, uh, it's her duty to, you know, build source, but the CRCs that she works with, they do that as well. And it's really, if you think about it, just like with paper source, you want the coordinators involved in that because they're the ones completing the visits. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they, they learn the protocol, they learn the nuances of the protocol and how everything is different. And um, so it's been, uh, very satisfying for them to be involved. And and actually, um, you know, they have told me that, you know, uh, they've, I think they're on their third or fourth study building in eSource and they they really enjoy the, the process because I think a lot of coordinators would agree that when you build source, that is the time that you really are learning about the protocol so that you can adhere to the protocol moving forward with the visits and the expectations and working with the physician and the nurse practitioner and just making sure everything is captured the way it's intended to. Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, at that point, you really have to go over, you're going through everything with a fine tooth comb to make sure that you're going to capture every data point that the protocol requires. So yeah, I think just the the act of building the source does make you more familiar with the protocol. You're a lot more prepared uh, going into your visits. Uh, so that's that's a really good point and something that, you know, as a site, you definitely would want to have your coordinator involved in. Uh, and to go even backwards a little more, is this something that you guys have figured out a way to offset the cost through amendments on your budgets with sponsors? Or have you guys kind of broached that issue yet? I think there's a few things about that that, you know, are Obviously, they're going to be ongoing for us as we, you know, continue down uh, our pipeline of work. And as we negotiate new contracts, it's definitely going to be an item on the table um, because there's a few things to consider, especially from the CRO standpoint, you know, and, and especially now for a lot of sites who are having remote monitoring visits with eSource, you can argue that monitor visits can be reduced. You know, I'm I'm sure no one is comfortable with not having any monitor visits, but what we have suggested to a few companies that we're working with is maybe just have, you know, if you want to have an SIV WebEx, you the first monitoring visit after the first few subjects are enrolled, maybe they come on site and they speak with the um, investigator, they look at the source, they look at the drug, they do those things, those formalities that they need to do. And then maybe several of the interim monitoring visits in between are done remotely. And then maybe they come back on site at closeout and, you know, they package the drug and they do all the other formalities that they need to do. And they do it that way. So, if you're reducing the number of monitoring visits, you're reducing your travel costs. 
And so if you're reducing your travel costs, why not partner with the site in order to to make that happen? Yeah, no, that's that's another great point. Yeah, you're like, technically, yeah, you're saving them money in the long run. I mean, not in the long run, in, immediately. You're saving them money by saving on travel for their, their monitors. I mean, and let's face it, if you work at a site and you're doing remote monitoring visits right now without eSource, it's terrible. Yes. It's awful to have to redact redact so much source facts or not facts, but hopefully not facts, but in some cases and scan everything. It's awful. And we're having to do some of that now. So I, I can understand. It saves everybody time and money, but that, that's a fair point. I never considered the idea of uh, potentially being able to get the CRO to back off of their monitoring schedule a little bit, but it would make sense and they could do it anytime. It's all always there for them to go in and start doing source data verification if, if you're granting them access. Right. And we, we've been promoting this since we were on EREG a year and a half ago. The documents are there. You can, you can access them anytime before your visit or whenever you would like to, you know, and ongoing throughout the trial. You know, you don't have to come here. You don't have to wait on an email it's there. You can go in and, and view it at any time. So, you know, I would I would argue another thing that CROs would need to think about is how this is going to help their pool of CRAs. I mean, one would need to kind of consider, do I need as many CRAs if all of my sites are using eSource? It seems like the pr- productivity of CRAs would could be increased because they're decreasing all the travel time. Yeah, you also might be able to you might be able to put a tamp on some of that turnaround and burn on these CRAs because, you know, almost everyone I talk to is, oh, feels like they're, they travel too much. They spend too much time on the road. So yeah, if you could take some of the burden of, of travel off of them, then they also might save money just by retaining their employees at a higher rate. Absolutely. You know, and, and add more value to their work. And you know, I, I I know you've said this before, and we've encountered the same thing. Maybe some of the new CRAs enjoy the travel. Maybe they do, but people, CRAs who have been in the business for, you know, more than a couple of years, I think they're all tired of it. And, um, but you know, it's a part of the job and what's expected of them. But, you know, it just seems like this would provide so much more job satisfaction for them. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. And again, you're going to maybe open yourself up to better talent who doesn't want to travel all the time, uh, since that's a requirement of the job. If it's not so much a requirement of the job anymore, then you can, again, you open up your pool of good CRA applicants at that point. Uh, but yeah, I, I've almost never hear from a CRA who's excited to keep traveling or who hasn't had additional sites dumped on them in a different part of the country yeah. <laughs> that they've had to add to their itinerary now. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's actually interesting. And it, it also makes me curious why CROs haven't, mm. uh, really taken on the burden of e-source or if that's something else that's going to come down the road, uh, why wouldn't they provide uh, an e-source platform to sites directly as opposed to the burden and cost being on the site? I, I see that. And, you know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I would agree with that, and I I kind of see the other side of it. I mean, I, I understand why they would think that, but as a site, I would not want different e-reg systems from different CROs. I would not want different e-source platforms. I mean, it's bad enough with all the EDC platforms that we have that, you know, I, I feel like the site would want more consistency on their end. I see the argument that the CROs would make that, you know, they would equally have different systems to use. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a fair point. <laughs> I know one CRO that we work very closely with. They're, we're the first site that's using eSource. They have other sites that use eReg, but we're the first one that's been on eSource. So, you know, they've been very accommodating. They've been very gracious and and everything. But, you know, now that you say that, I wonder how they're going to feel when all of their sites are on e-source and using different vendors and that sort of thing. Right, right. Well, hey, I, I'd consider it a nice uh, way to turn the tables because there's nothing worse than having 
uh, 50 different logins for EDCs and right. EPRO systems and, you know, uploading images somewhere. So at least <laughs> this is our chance to make them have to log into different systems. <laughs> yeah. Take some take some small satisfaction in that. <laughs> you know, something else from a, a contracting point of view, um, you know, and, and a lot of sites do this with their contracting. They work in uh, funds for archival and storage. Sure. Well, when you're on sure. eSource, you can use that money or whatever you're used to negotiating and use that to go towards your eSource funding as well. So, yeah, which I'm going to, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that that's, you know, if well negotiated, you're still going to, you're probably going to come out ahead uh, if you just bundle those costs and call it a, I mean, you can leave them as archiving costs or you could, you know, move them around and bundle them as your, you know, e-source, e-reg costs. But ultimately it seems like something you'd, you'd cover your cost and probably come out ahead uh, at the end of the day. Right. And, you know, I would, I would sell this to anybody I was negotiating with. I mean, the data is available in real time. It's accessible anytime. The quality of the data is much higher. Uh, there's no issue with legibility. We think that the value is there because there are less mistakes. There's going to be less queries. And one thing from the site point of view are all the efficiencies that we have seen from not having paper. And those things, I mean, there's so many things associated with paper that sites will discover, you know, as far, and it could be with space within the office, bookcases that were used to house binders you you're not going to need them you know we've had book carts in our offices to put cart you know charts on to take to the monitor room and that sort of thing or just to be working on we don't need those the the space thing is huge especially for small offices it's it's really big and this is also we another initiative that we started this year was we wanted to centralize our edc we wanted to have you know, one person or however many individuals doing all the EDC for all three of our offices. And eSource has made that so much easier because you're not moving the source data around, you know, to one location or to another location. It is accessible from every location and it's everything is sped up because the person who's doing the EDC after the we have a QC process that we've implemented. And after the QC process is done and the EDC is done, we see a quicker turnaround time in that as well. So there, there's another value add. Well, I mean, and right. Even those employees can be at home. They, really they can, can be anywhere, I, I assume. You know, if, as, long as, as long as they can log into real time and the EDC, then there's really no, no barrier uh, other than an internet connection. Uh, so that's, I like that. I, I very much like the idea of, you know, centralizing what you can and what makes sense. So that's a something I've thought about too. I think that's a really smart move to try to keep that as as centralized as possible. Because again, if you just create, let your coordinator go, you know, churn and burn through their patients, collect their data, you know, in a in a high quality way, of course. But it takes some of that data entry burden away from them at that point. Another thing that uh, is is true is you don't have misfiled source. You know, I know some people, you know, put source in notebooks, some put them in those, you know, cardboard medical record files. And sometimes those can get misfiled. And, you know, the moment when you're looking for something and all the blood is lost from your face because you can't find it. And, you know, honestly, you know, every site has gone through this, if they would just be honest, everybody has lost something at some point. And, you know, the good thing about it is it it's eventually found. Sure. Um, but with the, these electronic things, it, you, you're not going to lose it like that. That's just not going to happen. So all the time and energy placed into that. Yeah, that's a fair point. Again, yeah, a lot of the error, possibility of error just, yeah, is taken away at that point. Because, yeah, it's, yeah, you're right. We've, uh, you know, there's a piece of paper stuck to the back of another piece of paper that's filed somewhere else. And that's, that's not even a possibility anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would call that a code red, you know, and everybody, <laughs> <laughs> everybody would stop what they were doing and tear the office apart and 
until it was located. <laughs> so how about the uh, SOP process for, uh, you know, implementing these systems? Did you find any, mm-hmm. uh, I assume that's a pretty much like everything else in clinical research. So, so sort of an ongoing evolving process as you really figure out, you know, you've got an idea of how things work and then, uh, then you figure out how things really work, which is, uh, <laughs> kind of how, you know, same way it works when you get a new protocol. Uh, what was the SOP development? Uh, how has that process been? Or did you guys use a, any kind of outside help with that? Or did it real time help provide some guidance maybe? Uh, real time was, uh, very helpful. They did provide the information we needed for um, the system and how the system, you know, is set up, designed, secure, verified, and that sort of thing. They provided us with a lot of really good documentation. Uh, we've we've had some, uh, what we believe to be some really good SOPs uh, for quite some time now. And uh, knowing we had gone through the E-Reg implementation and now the e-source implementation, we we knew that this was just going to be a process for our SOPs and that we were just going to need to update them as we went along. It wasn't going to be possible to not update them because as we were going through the process, the, the CROs and the sponsors are wanting to see our SOPs and how we're you know delivering this, how we're complying and all of this. So it's just, um, you know, it's a work in progress. And we've updated a couple of them a few times now. And um, we just know that with this, that we're going to continue to see some process change within our office. And we're going to have to update that as we move along. So it's fluid. But uh, we, we keep that up and center and ready uh, because we want the sponsors and the CROs to feel good about what we're doing. And we're very, sure, sure. you know, we're one of the sites. We're very transparent. If they want to see our SOPs, we send them. We we want them to trust us and to feel good about what we're doing here. Yeah, and that's uh, I think that will definitely serve you best in the long run, you know, to be to be that transparent and to be that fluid. I mean, I think it's uh, one of the benefits of not necessarily working within a large large institution or a very bureaucratic institution as you know oftentimes hospitals and universities can be <laughs> i mean a lot of those sites that i know they're still working on excel spreadsheets rather than e anything you know they're still hand entering uh, any data into excel spreadsheets so you know it really gives you the opportunity to to evolve to be progressive and to sort of make any changes and correct course as you go so i i love that i think if you're going to successfully implement a system like this you you almost have to be that way. Uh, and then, um, lastly, I'm sort of interested to know about the training process for your staff and for your investigators even. So has that, you know, provided any challenges or is it, did you find that to be a relatively intuitive process for your, for your staff? You know, I, I think, you know, we're like most other sites and companies and as far as people go with software and electronics and You know, younger people catch on to it so much more easily. We have used computers and different softwares for other functions for a long time now. So I feel like for the most part, 90% of the staff caught on to it immediately. Uh, There is some training, but it's basic and it's, you know, very easily attained. Some of the investigators, you know, the, the staff, our approach is we just work with them. The coordinators work with them. Even while they're seeing patients, you know, they have the iPad or the laptop in there. They help them enter data and transcribe for them and uh, just provide as much support uh, with them as they can. But, you know, our investigators are, you know, they're computer literate. They seem to adapt, uh, I would say, better than I thought that they would. A couple of them really grabbed hold of it and really ran with it. So we're, we've been very happy with everybody's performance on the system so far. Sure. No, that's good to hear. And I know that can be a, I mean, just depending on what your, you know, staff and investigators look like that can, could present some challenges. So I'm glad to hear it's gone, gone smoothly for you. I know we, my previous job, we did implement some E-reg uh, towards the end of my time there a couple of years back. And uh, I, I was concerned about, adoption and training uh, across the the system so mm-hmm. uh, I guess you guys are 
are you guys a series of standalone sites or more than one standalone site? We're a, a multi-specialty site. We we have three sites in the Tampa area, and um, we operate all three sites. We have uh, three MDs, one nurse practitioner, and uh, we have six coordinators, and uh, we have a, a business office staff, which includes a, a couple of dedicated recruiters. Um, so we, you know, I, we're a high-functioning site, excellent staff. So, but yeah. Sure. You kind of know what you've got there. So that that's, I think the point I was trying to make too, is that, you know, you've got your arms around your staff and you, you kind of know each, each person's level of, of capability, which I think is, again, there's a learning curve, you know, there's, there's plenty of people who have issues just with the EDCs that, you know, we use now. So that's a, again, just an interesting little aspect of the, the e-source and e-reg that I'm, I'm, I'm always just looking to see how well adopted and how well how intuitive it is for people to use. So it's good to hear that you guys have, have taken to it pretty easily. Right. I would say that, um, you know, we, we have about 20 employees overall. I mean, we see ourselves as a medium size site. Some other people think we're larger, you know, but I guess it's all relative to what you're doing or how many studies sure, you're doing. Sure. But, um, you know, I feel like in this day and time, uh, everybody wants, you know, to be as efficient and as effective in their jobs as they can be. Our coordinators have been nothing but supportive in moving in this direction, and they've really wrapped their arms around this, and um, they are happy uh, with the process. They are they don't want to do anything with paper. We have a couple of studies, obviously, that are still on paper because we're not fully on eSource. We just started a couple of months ago, so we, we still have to move through that process. And there's there's a couple that are still on paper, but you know they, they just enjoy working with the software so much. So from an employer standpoint, I'm very happy with uh, their satisfaction. That's awesome. I say it's good to have uh, everybody on the same page. I personally... Uh... Imagine a world with no more binders and uh, <laughs> no more sticky notes. So that's uh, it's a very comforting thought, and I hope that we that we all get there. <laughs> right. Yeah, I hope so too. I mean, there's there's so many things that you know are so beneficial for sites, and you know we understand it can be scary, and there is a an element of uncertainty for some people. But like us, we you know we did our research. We did a really good planning process. And, you know, at some point you just have to jump into it and start doing it. And any software system is only as good as you use it. And you really got to jump in and start using it so that you can see the full potential that uh, these things have for you and how it can affect your business. Yeah. And I think that's a really, again, a really astute point is that these systems can be great or they can be terrible. It really depends on how well you use them and how much you use them. And we kind of talked a little bit about that before we started that I'm really convinced that the more you use the system and the more you integrate all the different elements, that the more powerful it becomes and the easier it becomes to use. Uh, and I think that's a, it's an important point too. I, I've often tried to just sort of dip my toe in the water with, you know, these new systems and that's great to an extent, but you really don't see the full value until you start integrating all the different aspects and then put it all together, you know, in the bigger, the bigger scheme of things. Absolutely. And, you know, two other components real time has is a reloadable debit card and um, a text feature that you can text and communicate with subjects directly uh, through the CTMS. And so when you're talking about retention and retention is huge, you know, recruitment is one thing, retention is the other side of the coin and is huge. And we want all of our subjects, when they enter a study, we want them to remain opted in for all text messages. We, you know, we push them, we ask them, we want them, we communicate that over and over to them to try and, because we want all of our appointments confirmed, we want them engaged in what they're doing. And because, I mean, that's just the beginning. Because when you have a subject in a study, you want them, obviously, there's more important things that they need to be focused on using the medication, doing their diary entries, all of those things. And it starts with how you set the tone for the communication during the study. And so we see a lot of value in that. 
The other thing is a lot of subjects, you know, they come and they do a study and they're getting the benefit of the medication and they're getting the benefit of seeing a doctor and seeing a nurse practitioner in um, the healthcare associated with that. But they're also, you know, you're paying them. And the reloadable debit card is an excellent feature because we, you give them one at the beginning of the study, they can keep it for many studies afterward. And it, it gives the site a lot of flexibility. And our goal is to pay everybody on the same day as their visit. And we want to show them that we are interested in them, that uh, we're trustworthy, and that if we say we're going to pay them, we're going to pay them. And there should be no questions about that. So we feel those debit cards have really added a lot of value and have really helped our retention in the study. So yeah, and I would definitely echo that. We did the same thing maybe six months ago. We added a, a debit card system. And I think it's, you know, not putting people through the hassle of having to go cash a check or jump through any extra hoops. You just give them the card at the beginning and reload it. And, you know, sometimes it's not a significant amount of money, but it's it's the, even that alone is enough to help them, you know, uh, get a meal or get down the road in their vehicle, make it to your, to all their appointments. And, uh, I think it really does. It shows a lot more, uh, a lot more attention to the, to the patient. And it's a little more, I don't know, to go back to what you said, I think it does help significantly with, with retention. So that's a, yeah. that's sort of a hidden value for sure. Right. And also, I mean, I don't, I'm sure there's a lot of other sites who are issuing checks to all their subjects, but you know, we've, you know, had some difficulties with that because, you know, we, have had some patients who have taken our checks and, you know, deposit them electronically and then try and deposit them in, in person and, you know, taking our routing number and pay, try to pay their bills with it and, you know, stuff like that. So, I mean, there, you know, there's all kind of things out there in the world today. And I think these debit cards only help protect the site as well. Yeah, for sure. And we had patients who don't have bank accounts, who don't have checking accounts even. So, you know, that puts them at a, you know, behind the eight ball. If you hand them a check and they say, well, what do I, what do I do with this? Absolutely. Well, you know, you don't, you can avoid that conversation altogether by, by handing them a reloadable visa card and then they're on their way. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, again, just sort of a, an extra little cherry on top to help, you know, a show the patients that you're, you know, you're professional, that you're serving them. And at the same time, uh, you know, it's easier for you. You're not having to cut checks. You know, you just, Load it up in the system and you're good to go. Who writes checks anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I know. Well, that's just another one of those funny things about clinical research. You know, we should be out here on the cutting edge and, you know, I've, uh, probably a lot of sites are writing checks. You know, I know that if I'm in the grocery store in line and I see somebody in front of me writing a check, I'm like, ah, oh, dude, come on. <laughs> really? We're we writing checks now. <laughs> but, you know, but it's not, it's not uncommon for someone to hand out a check at a research site. Yeah. And on an, on a side note, waiting on a check from a CRO. How about that? Oh no, don't <laughs> let's, that's another, I think that's another podcast that we can, we can it, do that one is. next time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I do. I want to thank you so much for coming on. We probably have more we could cover. Uh, if you would like to, please come back. We can talk some more about this. Uh, where can people find you online? That would be great. I'm on LinkedIn. And um, more clinical research is m o r e c r dot com, and uh, we have a Facebook page as well, and um, easily accessible. So if anybody who's listening to the podcast has you know questions about moving into e reg or e source or questions about real time CTMS, I'm happy to help. If they want to reach out to me and connect. Um, I'd be, I'd be happy to help that. I think it's, you know, one of the most beneficial things a site can do right now. Very good. Yeah. Please do reach out to Jeff. Uh, you know, my hope is that this does become, you know, an outlet where sites can all share information with each other. And as a result, they're going offline and, and talking and, uh, sort of sharing their best practices with each other. So I'll make sure we link you in our show notes, uh, on the website. And again, I want to thank you so much for coming on and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Thank you, Brad, very much. As always, thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can check out full episode transcripts, show notes, and contact information at our website, notetofilepodcast.com. Thanks again.